Um, I just want to take a moment to I mean, first introduce myself. And uh, my name is Jeremy Schneider. I'm, I am the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Laverne. And I want to take a moment to truly thank all of you for being here today. Participation and um, attendance is such a gift. And I know that you have a lot of things that you're doing, a lot of ways that you can spend your time. And so, um, the fact that you have chosen to be here in this space with me and with all of us in this community is significant and I want to thank you for that. Um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to get the chance to talk about this topic, um, equity-minded learning and course assessment. It's something that I think is incredibly important and it's particularly in this day, day and age, it's becoming even more important as we move forward. So taking some time to really be intentional and think about uh, what this means for us, what it means for our classes, what it means for our institutions, what it means for our programs. This is something that is time well spent. And um, it, it is my goal to make sure that this is productive time today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And as you all know from the working on Zoom, you got to adjust all the windows and do all that stuff so that you can see what's going on. Uh, so one second there. All right. Um, so not too long ago, Alicia Dowd and Estella Marie uh, ben Simone identified some barriers that there are to establishing equitable outcome achievement, and their work was really groundbreaking. Um, and from that, the USC Center for Urban Education took that up and developed this idea of what is equity mindedness and how does that actually impact what we're doing in the classroom. Um, they identified a few or four key things that we're I'm going to ask you to take up as we move forward today. Um, they noted that as you um, as you work to develop equity mindedness, as you start to think about how it impacts you, your classroom, your students, there are four things, four practices that are really important. One, it's going to be crucial that you assess your own racialized assumptions. Two, it's going to be important that you acknowledge the sometimes lack of knowledge of the history of race and racism in higher education in our disciplines and in our courses. They also note that it's important for us each to take responsibility for the success of historically underserved and minoritized students, that it's something that we all must do and something that sometimes gets left off to the side. And finally, they note that it's crucial that we critically assess the racialization in our own classroom practices and the ways that race, the ways that racism, the ways that all of these different things sneak into what we're doing and how we interact with students. And so each of these things, it's going to be important that we take each of these things on separately and think about um, just truly what's happening in our classroom spaces and how they're impacting what we do with students and sometimes what we do to students. Now, this isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. I mean, because we have this list of things that we're supposed to be doing, that's great, that's wonderful, but how do we go about doing it? One of the things that I'm going to ask that we take up as a community today is to think about this in terms of um, Donald Schoen's double loop learning. Um, particularly as he speaks to reflection in action and reflection on action. Now, a fun way to think about the difference between these two things is to, especially right now, consider what it's like to be in a cold room, you know, where you know it's cold, you feel it, you understand that this is the situation. And so the question is what to do about it. Now, in terms of reflection in action, the easiest thing to do is I say, okay, it's cold. I need to go over to the thermometer. I'm going to adjust the thermometer. I'm going to make this moment warmer. And it's a very much a momentary thing. What's going on now? How do I address what's in front of me in this space? Um, if we take up the idea of reflection on action, we would start to say, okay, why is this room actually cold? 
Is it that the windows are old and so I need to consider updating that? Is it maybe that I need to find where that draft is coming from? But what is it structurally that uh, that's going to take more time to work on and to fix that I need to address and need to consider? And I propose that as we start to think about equity and, and take up an equity-minded perspective, that we really need to address both of these levels of reflection overtly. And that we need to stop and say, first, what are the big things that I need to think about? And then move that into our, our smaller spaces and to say, okay, what are, the, what are the things that are going on in front of me in my classes? I want to take a moment to acknowledge that y'all are lucky. You have an incredible Center for Teaching and Learning that is very, very well known for its um, work in anti-racist pedagogies and anti-racist practices. And so, um, and you also are lucky in that you have this entire series, which is devoted to things like, okay, what do I do in my classes? What's some real time stuff that I need to take care of as I see my courses coming towards me? Um, how can I get ready for those? But I also want to acknowledge that for this particular session, some of the things I'm gonna ask you to do and to think about can't be done between now and when your courses start. They, they need to be carefully done. You, they require research, they require a lot of thought, and they require that you spend time really analyzing you, your discipline, and your institution. Those bigger things are gonna take time and that's okay. At the end, we're going to talk about some things that you can do in the moment while you're teaching. Um, but I want us to consider a bigger picture, not just this just in time immediate, what do I do next week uh, as well. Now, I'm an, I'm an assessment geek. <laughs> I love assessment. I think that it's one of the most powerful things that we can do to enhance student learning. I think that it's one of the most amazing things that we can do to improve our teaching. And I think it's just fun. And so that may make me weird, but <laughs> assessment is awesome. Um, I didn't come by this naturally. Uh, I'll be truthful. One of the people that um, helped me take this perspective assessment up is Frank Serafini and his work with um, different types of assessment. Uh, Frank Serafini notes that measure, uh, assessment generally comes in three forms. It's either done for measurement, it's done for procedure, or it's done for inquiry. And uh, just as a side note, please know I will be sending you the slides and sending you a list of resources so you can dig into each of these um, scholars on your own. Um, but the really wonderful thing about what Serafini is saying is that if we are coming to our classrooms as a space of learning. And if we say, hey, I'm noticing something, I want to know more about this in my classroom space. Assessment becomes something we do because we want to learn. We want to learn about teaching, we want to learn about our students, we want to learn about our practices. And this is a beautiful form of reflection on action, where we kind of derive uh, questions in order to take a look at what we're doing and, and make our courses better in the future. Um, I think it's also important that we consider assess assessment as a form of curiosity. And this is where the reflection in action comes into play, where we're in our, our classroom space and we're saying, okay, I'm curious about what I'm seeing now. I'm curious about what I'm noticing over on this side of the room. I'm curious about who is speaking at this moment and why. And taking that up and, and even in that moment when we are interacting with um, with people in our classroom, with our students to say, okay, what's going on? And how am I adjusting to this space? And so that assessment is curiosity becomes an important part of what we do when we're taking forward equity mindedness. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So first thing we need to do is reframe assessment to think of it as inquiry and curiosity. And the, the second thing we need to do is think about assessment on a grander scale. In the description of this session, I said it's important that we think about um, how we address the needs of all of our students instead of the needs of all our students. And this sounds weird when you read it, but what it comes down to this is sometimes in, at the institutional level especially, we take a look at the big picture. We see um, 
we, we take a look at graduation rates, retention rates, we take a look at student success rates in terms of all students. But we can actually do much more when we start to disaggregate the data, disaggregate the experiences. Because all students doesn't equal all students. We need to start to take a look at how different areas, how different groups of students are interacting with our classroom experiences, how they're being successful or not successful. And more important, at that point in time, we need to start to ask why. We need to start to ask what it means and how we begin to address this. It's so easy to get caught up in this idea of students as a monolith, but that's not the way our students come to our classes. And so we need to begin to think about this, not only in terms of our institutional data, but also in terms of our program and classroom experiences. So let's start with that reflection on action and start to talk about the bigger picture disaggregation. If we um, go back to the ideas that were noted in equity mindedness, we need to assess our own positioning. We need to assess higher ed's history. We need to begin to think about program and department student success. And we need to begin to think about course, uh, course level student success. I am a huge, huge, huge proponent of reflection. I think the more time we spend thinking about who we are, how we got to this space, and how we are moving that into other spaces is really, really important. And so beginning to address our own assumptions and how that's impacting the classroom is the first step towards equity-minded assessment. And so here are a few questions that we can use to help to start do this. And I'm going to be completely honest with this, or this first question. This one's more directed at my white male colleagues, you know, because we have a space that's constructed around us. And so to stop and say, when did you become, first become aware of race? That can be a significant step into acknowledging that race impacts everything we do, even when the world is constructed around our, our perspective as the norm, which is not good. Um, we also need to start to talk about what personal stories we have regarding race and what they illuminate about us and how they are impacting our classroom practices. We be, need to begin to think about race and how you think about students and their race. We need to start to think about race, re, racism and equity-minded um, practices and how that's imp impacting our interactions. And a number of people have brought this forward, um, the great Bell Hooks, uh, Django Paris, Brookfield, and Hess, all of them have identified some of these key questions. And um, as I noted, you'll receive these uh, list of sources, and I highly suggest that you dig into them if you haven't. Um, but I know just, I think it's important that if I'm asking you to do these things that I also offer some of this stuff up as well. I can tell you the moment that I first understood that my experience of the world wasn't like everyone else's experience. Um, I grew up in a self-segregated town, a little town on the Colorado, uh, Nebraska border. Um, I grew up in a space where you didn't see race is what we were told, race didn't exist. Um, but I had a great, wonderful friend on the track team and his father was uh, an Ecuadorian immigrant and one day we were getting ready for a race and he's a, he's a sprinter and he said, I really need to do um, well in this race. And so if you see me lagging behind, I want you to shout, La Migra, La Migra. And I was like, Eddie, what is, what's, what's that all about? He said, that means immigration and that will give me the kick I need. And at that moment I was like, wow, yeah, my experience is not your experience. And I need to consider what that means. And um, so starting to understand these types of ways where we were raised uh, from a certain perspective and how that can easily slide into what we're doing in the classroom if we don't interrogate it, if we don't think about it. Um, that is one of the things that uh, is an inherent danger in higher education. We're taught that higher education is impassionate, that you know, it's objective, that we don't bring ourselves into the classroom, and so, but we do. And so stopping to consider all of these things 
is the first step into making sure that we are openly and overtly addressing equity-minded um, approaches to assessment and equity-minded approaches to our classrooms. Um, another, as I noted, another key aspect of this is thinking about the systemic nature of higher education. Um, as an assessment scholar, I think a lot about formalized assessment and how it came to be. And I find this to be um, just really a, um, uh, a fascinating thing, a scary thing. Um, there's one particular time in educational history, and I'll use this as an example to think about how it's impacting our classes. Um, in around 1917, coming out of World War I, there was a push to uh, quantify intelligence. Um, people wanted to be able to sort other people based on their intelligence. It was the kind of the rise of the psychometrician, um, you know, how we were, or the country was in a place where we were trying to or use psychology to make boxes and figure out what was going on. But this had a huge impact on higher education. Uh, in particular, Carl Brigham Young um, was a huge proponent of, the, of finding ways to quantify intelligence. And he started to um, create the first IQ test. When he did this, <clears throat> uh, he drew upon the idea that IQ could be quantified if we look, took a look at literacy. And not just literacy, but literacy in the English language. And so I think it's important to stop and think about where this is at um, in, the, in the historical period. In the United States at this point in time, this is only 50 years removed from when slaves were banned from being able to read and write. That's a short period of time. Likewise, this is a, a period of um, great immigration where there are a lot of people coming in who, for whom English is their second language. And so prioritizing literacy, the ability to read and write in English had huge impacts. Basically what it did is it created a situation where a certain group of people um, and their way of interacting with the world was privileged. And this uh, then filtered out into a lot of other areas because Brigham became someone who was very influential. Not only did Brigham work to create the first IQ test, his work was taken up by Princeton and went on to be the way that um, colleges decide who gets to attend college and who doesn't. His work um, greatly fed into the eugenics movement and the selective um, immigration acts that were part of the 1920s about who was allowed to come to the United States. His work was the foundation of the SAT. His work was the foundation of percentile grading. So all of this, um, all of this, and it's tricky and it's privileging and everything that is embedded in this work that he did has become the foundation of higher education. So these racist implications, these systemic inequalities that are built into these things have filtered into so much of what we do because it is just how we do it. And so that's gonna be why it's important that we begin to stop and say, okay, what are the hidden values that are built into um, higher education? What are the hidden values that are built into my discipline? And what are the hidden values that are built into what we do? And to do that research to say, okay, if what am I inadvertently sometimes bringing into the classroom space? Uh, and how is this impacting course, my course development and my interactions with my students? Does, um, let's, let's step back a little bit. Does anyone have, um, that's kind of dug into this with their own disciplines, are there places where you've noticed this type of background in your own um, work or in your, in your own interactions, uh, disciplinary interactions?
all right, so this is what I'm going to suggest. If it's quiet, that means it's a good idea to go out and do some more research in this area, <laughs> to dig into our the black boxes that are disciplines and to say, okay, where are there uh, practices that we draw upon that really uh, disenfranchise and that put a lid on equity instead of actually opening up our disciplinary spaces for our students. All right, so as I noted, um, we need to start to think about the, the greater historical impacts, the greater ways that we have been conditioned in education and how that's, um, um, how that's influencing what we do in the classroom. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, something just popped up in the chat real quick. Yes, so grading. Um, why do we grade? Is it necessary? How is it supportive, not supportive to student learning? This is something that we bring into classroom spaces that once again is um, often connected to the idea of sorting, which is also connected to the idea of privileging, which is also connected to the idea of, of ensuring that um, certain people get through and other people don't. Um, penalizing students for coming late to class, submitting late work, and not paying attention in class. I love this one as well. So thank you for uh, providing this. Um, I'm gonna geek out here for a second in another way. Um, there's something, I'm a rhetorician as well, and there's a, an idea that we have that's called epidactic rhetoric, which is the way that we teach people to fit into spaces using praise and blame. And think about our early educational experiences, how um, classrooms are set up um, to use praise and blame to put students in a place where they must be compliant using things like penalizing lateness, um, using um, the ways that we demand attention and, you know, reinforce um, compliance. Um, yeah, that's a big part of what we do in the classroom as well. And yes, also, um, science and eugenics and all of that. Uh, yeah, definitely. I would, I would definitely suggest if you, um, Sadie, if you haven't had the opportunity to read Norbert Elliott's On a Scale, there's some really fun stuff in there, particularly chapter two, um, where he digs in, into the idea of the connection between eugenics and our classroom practices. Um, awesome. Sharon, I love this too. Um, uh, ways of looking at participation in a different way. I'm going to ask you to put that on the back burner for now and when we get to classroom practices to bring that back up um, because I think that's that's going to be a great way that we can start to talk about how we can overtly bring an equity-minded perspective into our classroom practices. Um, so for now, I'm going to um, kind of go back to a bigger picture perspective. Um, once we start to think about these, um, the ways that our classrooms have been conditioned, it's important to start to think about our home context and to begin to say, okay, how are students doing in our programs, in our departments, at our institutions? And to once again, disaggregate the data to say, okay, how are all of our students doing instead of looking at it from the perspective of a monolithic student body? And this is gonna be important also to think about in terms of HIPs, high impact practices. Uh, we often see you know, people say, okay, well, we need to make sure that our, our students are studying abroad. We need to make sure that we're using portfolios. We need to you know, draw on all these other high impact practices. And that's wonderful. I'm not gonna say that we shouldn't uh, make use of high impact practices, but we need to do it intentionally and ask who is actually doing these things and who isn't. Um, Anthony Abraham uh, Jack in his book Privileged Poor takes up this notion as well to say that um, there, for some students, you know, study abroad is just what you do. For other students, it would be wonderful if they could do that, but they just can't afford it. So once again, the structure is privileging um, through the use of high impact practices. Um, who gets to succeed? Who doesn't? And um, reinforcing the, you know, problematic structures of education as a whole. And so at this point in time, we need to say, okay, how can we open up that space for all of our students and to ensure that we are taking an equity-minded approach to student success 
in that way as well. But really, the key is to start to ask what's going on, who is succeeding and why, and who is not succeeding and why, and opening up that uh, that's, uh, conversation in your program and advocating for students. Um, once you begin to start to take a look at what's going on in at the you know at your institution or what's going on in your program, we need to start to dig into the kind of the course level data. Um, as as I've noted, personal reflection is so important, and our programs are made up of individual classes. So we need to even take a step further and start to think about how we're helping all students in our courses in our individual courses. Um, once again, this can be an easy. Uh, this can be a place where we can say, oh, yeah, you know, let's say that, you know, a good 25% of my students got A's. That's wonderful. And, you know, and a lot of them got B's and there were only a couple that didn't follow through with the class. And if we just keep it at the high level, kind of a um, all students perspective, it's easy to miss the trends and it's easy to miss the questions that we need to start asking. Um, so one of the most powerful impacts that you can have on your teaching is just starting to break down your um, break down your grades, break down your student success indicators, and disaggregating that data for yourself. Who's succeeding in your classes and why? Um, this is going to be a place where we can then um, take up some more uh, long-term uh, fixes to address what's going on there. I know for a fact that uh, the Claremont College's CTL has done a lot of work with decolonizing syllabi, and that's a great first step, you know, to say, you know, whose news knowledge am I valuing? What perspectives am I valuing? And how am I bringing that into the classroom? How am I making sure that my students, that all of my students see themselves in the discipline, that all of my students see themselves in our practices? Um, but it's going to be important that we go beyond that. Um, just putting in a few more uh, pictures in your slides, that's a great first start or first step, but that isn't getting at the true picture of um, equity-minded practices um, that's, that we need to take up in order to ensure student success for all of our students. So, Breaking, once again, breaking down these trends, starting to figure out who's, who's getting through well and who's not, um, and then asking the question of how is that, how is that, how is your class structure um, creating that situation? That's an important first step. So these are all some of the kind of the reflection on action perspectives where we can step back after it's happened and really take our time and think about the structural issues. But it's also going to be important that we think about what we're doing in the moment and how um, taking a reflection in action um, perspective to how we are interacting with our students, how we're interacting with each other, and how we are finding ways to not only invite all our students into the space, but to ensure that, that they are able to interact freely, ask questions, and that we're not holding anyone back unintentionally. So before, um, before we do this though, are there any thoughts, questions, ideas? What are you thinking about the reflection on action stage of a created, creating an equity-minded approach to your courses? Please do feel free to chat or to unmute and ask questions, any uh, share away. Hi, Jeremy. 
me, Barbara. Oh, hello, Barbara. I was just thinking, um, like, uh, how important it this this first stage is really important. And is there a way for us to also share it with students, right? Because some a lot of the things that happen in the classroom, students might not know that that's our goal. Our goal might is decolonization and self reflection and thinking about the discipline as a human construct. You know, students inherit. They just think, oh, you go to school to learn things, and these are the things you're supposed to learn. Um, and so I think like thinking about how, how to articulate or make explicit these processes, you know, in your own uh, creation of course content and discipline and disciplinary choices or, or choices at the departmental level. Um, and also having students think about them too, right? Because your, our goal as educators is, is, is for students to also have that kind of criticality and self-awareness and awareness of structure. So that's just something that was spurred for me um, and thinking about your comments thus far. So thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing that forward. I greatly appreciate it because you're right. These aren't things that we should hide from our students. Um, we should talk about the history of higher education with our students. We should talk about these structures and um, do things like, um, well, I, the I've, I've been privileged to hear the way that uh, Dr. Jessica Tinklenberg, the director of the, your Center for Teaching and Learning, is uh, creating a course on inclusive pedagogies. And one of the things that she's doing early on is asking her students to write an autobiography of their educational experiences and to say, okay, this is um, where I've I have come from, and this is how I've experienced education. And then to go out and kind of uh, investigate the history of higher education and how it's informed that. I think these are some of the practices that we can actually bring into um, our disciplinary courses with our students is to say, okay, here is the history. Here are some of the things that have happened, good and bad, um, fun and not fun. And to ask your students to investigate, to go out and do some, um, some work on their own to see what, they, what they're finding. Um, to really just open that up and to say, okay, this is a truly meaningful part of what we're doing in the classroom. Um, so that's one way that you can bring students into it. Um, I and, you know, just even something along the lines of negotiating your syllabi, that can be a great way of starting to break down those practices, particularly in terms of uh, the comment that was made earlier um, by uh, Jorge Moreno, um, where we're talking about things like penalizing students for coming late to class, submitting late work, paying attention, you know, how we are, how courses are structured. And so bringing students into that conversation, negotiating with them about ways that we can have our, our classes work and function and actively talking about what's going on and why, um, that can be an important way of bringing students into that process as well. So thank you for that. I appreciate um, uh, you asking that question. Thank you. Uh, are there any other thoughts before we start to talk about reflection and action? All right, friends. So let's start to dig into this as well. So much of what we do is done in the moment. And when we are, particularly when we're teaching, it's easy to kind of get in that flow where you're like, okay, I'm here, you're here, I'm talking, you're listening, and this is fun, look at me go. And it can, it can be easy to lose track of what is actually happening in terms of facilitation, interaction, and it's only when um, something jarring happens in the classroom that we stop and say, wait a second, not everybody is in this same space in the same way that I am. And so <clears throat> the more we can do to set up a structure of questions, to set up a, a ways ahead of time to begin to say, who am I interacting with and why, that allows us in the moment to reflect and in the moment to make changes and not wait for those jarring interactions to, um, 
to create a more equitable set of experiences. One of the easiest things that you can do is just keep track of the students to whom you're speaking, the students to whom you're asking questions, the students that you're acknowledging in that space, and openly ask yourself, how am I addressing stereotype, threat, and imposter syndrome? Um, just by taking up these very questions and by starting to consider that in the moment, we're opening a space where we have to acknowledge the way that, um, that we are privileging certain students. We have to acknowledge ways that race, gender, and other factors are playing a role. And we have to ask ourselves, why am I doing this in this space? Um, the fortunate thing is for, for most of us, I mean, we're very much content experts. We know what we're talking about. We know um, how to deliver that discussion. We know how to deliver that lecture. And so we can begin to separate out the two processes in our minds um, to have a, have a sheet of paper where we can take tick marks and start to pay attention more overtly um, and to slow ourselves down to address these types of interactions in the classroom. Um, I'm going to, to stop and pause here for a moment. How many of you have actually taken up a practice like this to, you know, during a, a given class period to say, okay, who is it that I just asked a question to, or where am I looking as I'm, as I'm speaking? How many of you have taken up this practice in the past? Stephanie, thank you. You think about it all the time. What are some of the things that you notice as you go through this process in your courses? Well, I think one of my greatest fears as an educator is accidentally saying something that can be prejudiced or biased that I you know, didn't realize because of my own ideologies. So I'm constantly reflecting on who am I speaking to? Who am I posing those questions to? Who am I looking at or who am I not looking at in the eyes in the classroom? Right. Which, which forces me, you know, that awareness forces me to constantly make sure I make eye contact with every single person. And when I ask a question, I tell everyone, this question can be answered by anybody, not just, you know, the person who's responding right now. So I guess I, I try to make it sure that I leave it open. And then I also wait, I literally count 30 in my head to allow people to process the questions or to process what was just stated to give them time to think. And so there, there is a lot of moments of awkward silence in my classroom, because 30 seconds is a long time when it's really quiet. But eventually that gives people enough time to think about what was just said or what was just asked or you know, what was just you know, brought to our awareness that we never really thought about. And so it allows us to think about it before we begin speaking. Thank you very much for sharing that. I greatly appreciate it. I love the intentionality that you're bringing to those interactions. And I love the way also that you're acknowledging that silence is our friend. Um, if we can rush to, to fill that, but just allowing that processing time is another really important way to uh, provide a more equitable experience. So thank you for that. Um, friends, other folks, what are some other things that you were doing in your classes um, to kind of move these practices forward? Uh, Liz, you talk about um, addressing how we're asking questions and how we're soliciting participation. Um, would you mind speaking more to that? Sure. So um, I'm in the library, so I usually work with students on like a one-time basis. Um, but I think to, to build on what Stephanie was talking about, I think there's, it might not be appropriate every time, but sometimes to make that processing time explicit and say, I'm going to pause for a minute so we can all think about that. Maybe we can write something down. Um, and also possibly offering opportunities for students to write something or, um, contribute anonymously in some way, polling, it might be another way to do that too. Nice. Nice. So once again, providing that space where um, multiple people can come to 
come to that space where we aren't privileging just one particular type of interaction as well. Thank you. Um, Jorge, you have a hand up? Um, yeah. As Jorge Daytam, something I do is when I post a question is I tell them, talk to the person next to you. And then they have a conversation. And then sometimes the more vocal students, they do answer the question, but often they give credit to the other person or they give credit to someone who spoke before. So kind of like them knowing each other and knowing their, each other's names and giving each other credit really helps uh, students participate in non-traditional ways. Nice, I love that. Um, and that can help the kind of your introverted students you know, be a part of it as well. And so then I love that you're doing that, excellent. Other thoughts, friends? Um, I have one. Uh, sometimes, um, well, so whenever students write their papers, I have them do an acknowledgement and I tell them that they should put in their acknowledgements anyone who said anything in the class that inspired this. I tell them if some if there's a quote that someone in class said, you should write it down and you can put it in direct quotes in your paper and attribute it to them. Um, and then uh, we usually do like a gratitude part where we actually say like who was instrumental in like contributing to how you think about this from our class discussion and uh i say you know it feels good to receive attribution and it feels good to give attribution so that also helps students you know share those sort of private conversations that happen in small groups and then to see each other as off as um scholars who have something to contribute that is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I mean, and I mean, put that into contrast with some of the the lessons that our students have been taught about how they're supposed to interact in the classroom. That they're that they are supposed to just sit back and receive knowledge. That uh, they're supposed to um, that they are lesser than in that situation. And so that is a beautiful way of kind of pushing back against that and to say, no, you have something valuable to bring to this space, you know, to um, really take up the culturally sustaining practices and really say, no, you are here for a reason and you have something to add. I love that. So thank you very, very much for bringing that to the forefront too. Um, I'm going to just bring this last, the last question out. Um, because I think that this is a really important one to address in our classes as well. How are we addressing stereotype threat and imposter syndrome in, in our classes? How are we ensuring that our students aren't doing damage to themselves just by the very nature that we are um, structuring class? Um, this is one of those places where I'm a huge proponent of the co-creation of rubrics, the co-creation of assessment techniques, purposely for this um, for this point, when you um, get people to actually acknowledge what they know and what they don't know to bring to the forefront that, yeah, this is, this is hard for me too. And for all students to talk about where they are in their learning and for us to acknowledge where it's been a struggle for us. Um, this can begin to normalize the idea that learning is hard and that uh, we all have growth points and that this is okay. This is a natural part of the classroom. Um, so that's one of the practices I use to uh, push back against stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. Um, others out there, friends, what are some of the things that you're doing? So I can share something small. Um, Please. I teach science courses and, and one of the things I started doing a few years ago in my intro science courses, and I actually now pretty much do it in all my courses, is um, around the time of the first exam and when low grade notices are happening, um, I, share, I share my first semester of grades in college, or I share an exam that I failed in college. Um, and it's a very small, it's like 10 minutes of class time. Um, but what I stress is that being a college student is a skill. Um, and, and that everybody has bumps in the road. And, and I try to, that's also led me to design my own exams so that there are second chances um, in that intro course, at least. That's wonderful. That's so much fun. Uh, and what a great way to open that up for your students, for them to, to see the human side of that. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, friends, others, other practices that you're using to break down stereotype threat and imposter syndrome.
Well, I would encourage you to take up this, this thought even more and to consider other ways that, um, that you can make sure that students see who they are, how they're interacting in the community and that learning is hard and, that, um, and to address this overtly as well. I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. All right, so along with talking about um, who we're speaking to and who we are addressing, it's gonna be important that we reflect on who is speaking in the classroom, uh, who is answering questions, um, who is feeling um, open, we'll say that, open to be a part of the space and who isn't. Um, <clears throat> there's a great tool out there that uh, I believe it's called, Is He Talking Again? where it's just a simple button where you hit it and it records the amount of time that a single particularly white male student is speaking and you can um, use it in uh, class and, and in meetings. It's meant to be fun, but the fact that it exists shows us something about educational spaces. And so creating places where we get to open up these um, these venues make sure that all of our students feel as though they can contribute, that they have something to contribute and that uh, we want them to contribute. And it, actually acknowledging how we're balancing out um, who is a part of that space is really, really an important thing to do in the moment. Um, <clears throat> this can be, this can take on a number of different uh, forms. Um, Sharon, I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, that we return to the comment that you made earlier about participation. I need to pull that up again. Would you, would you mind speaking more to how you invite a wider array of participation? Sure. Um, one, I love Sarah's comment, by the way. I just want to second other people's hearts on that. I think that's a great idea. Um, I have been putting my students into groups pretty traditionally. Um, and I, when I ask questions, I often have them start by talking within their group. And um, many of the ones that are quiet tell me in their reflections that that's where they feel like they participate the most or that's where they learn a lot in talking to each other. And that sometimes that gives them the courage then to raise their hand in the bigger class but that when they recount to me their participation, because I, I have them talk to me in reflections about their participation, they're often doing these things in their small group or even getting their group together outside of class to do work that I just don't see in the classroom. And so I've started collecting information about how they self-assess participation. Nice, I love that. You know, and, and once again, another great example by collecting that information, bringing students into that space and valuing what, they, what they're doing in that space. Um, thank you for that as well. Uh, truly being overt about how we are ensuring that it's not a single group of students or a single perspective that's, um, that that we're relying on, that's such an important part of classroom facilitation. Um, but it doesn't happen unless we overtly say, who's here with me and how am I inviting the other students that aren't? And saying, that, like, much like you were noting, uh, participation comes in many forms and that's okay. Um, and providing those spaces as well. So friends, what are some other things that you're doing to, um, to think about the different groups of students that are acting and interacting. Uh, so mi mixing up groups regularly to, uh, to kind of break things up and find ways of getting, getting people to interact with uh, others in the classroom, which is important, nice. Um, some other things that you're doing. Yes, Stephanie, you're right. Um, depending on online or in person, that um, that impacts what we do, especially in the time of COVID. Um, so changing things up to um, to draw on hybrid practices. Would you mind speaking to that a little bit more as well? Sure. So 
if it's in person, you know, I notice you, you can just look at people's faces. <laughs> are they paying attention or are they zoned out kind of thing? And sometimes if you don't know, right, like um, I, I'll sometimes um, tell students like take notes or ask questions or in small group discussions, I'll have someone assign, you know, a member to take notes in that class group discussions or I give them like if it's online, I literally give them like a Google Doc with either a template of activities or create like a Google slide or, you know, create a post or something together. So that way there's, there is that interaction going. And if it's online, I bounce between the different breakout rooms for a couple minutes, just to listen to what's going on, see who's participating, see who's not participating. Um, or if it's quiet entirely, then I kind of just say like, Hey, do we know what's going on kind of thing? Um, but there's other things like exit tickets, you know, so or a reflection at the end of the day, um, just like a quick paragraph or just answering like what were the top three takeaways that you got out of this week's readings or something. Uh, another thing I have students do, um, even though it's not fully considered just class participation, it also involves the readings. I have students do like a reading and a personal reflection. Um, and that right there, I consider as participation too, because it's along with the lines of the themes and the theory that we're learning. So just small little things here and there where people will just do a free write, give me your free write, and I'll take a quick gander at it and that will be participation or notes. If a student is clearly taking notes or I'll sign a note taker if, you know, if a student comes to me and says, I'm very quiet and I know participation is part of the class, I'm like, well, how about you can be the class note taker? You know, you can be the class note taker and that way I know you're participating because listening is a form of participation. So send me that at the end of the week and we'll count that as your participation. And they love it because then they don't have to speak, but, and it's clear that they're learning as I review their notes. Thank you very much for sharing. I love the way that you're, you're opening up different, many different forms of participation. I and mean, if we kind of think about that in terms of how our students are um, taught about education, often they're taught that you speak and that's participation. But by opening that up, you are really framing a space where students can learn how to participate, learn how to be comfortable, and learn how to interact. I love that. That's wonderful. Um, oh, some great stuff is coming in through the chat. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge this as well. Um, asking students to write reflections on their participation and to tell you how they are, how they're doing it. That's a um, a great uh, uh, practice to take up, particularly when you talk about it with your students and to get them to acknowledge different types of participation and to acknowledge different ways that they are providing to the, um, the classroom community. Um, asking or providing students with roles that they can play like note taker, um, discussion facilitator, participation tracker. That's a, a great way once again of helping other students um, to see different forms of interaction and how they can um, how they can be a part of that community. Uh, so much if we aren't teaching our students how to be a part of the community, if we aren't breaking down um, these assumptions or structures that are built into the classroom, we are creating a situation that's once again going to just privilege the students that already know the rules and pushes back against students that are still becoming familiar with the, particularly the college um, classroom experience. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for noting that. Um, so providing a little gamification in the classroom uh, to help students that are not participating to participate in different ways. I love that. Um, Amy, would you like to speak to that a bit more and tell us a bit more about how you're doing that? Sure. Um, this was a few years back um, in one of the courses I was teaching and we, I would get students into four teams and I had this set of like four buzzers. It's like 12 bucks on Amazon. And so they would each get into their team. I'd play like the Jeopardy music in the background and um, we would sort of just do the exam review that way. Um, and it was really fun for them. They were interacting with peers that they might not have really talked to as much throughout the semester. So I kind of wish I had done games more all along but I will definitely implement that some more, but it was fun. It was like a really wild sensory experience in the classroom, but um, it was a way to kind of get everybody engaged and 
even more interactive with their textbook by looking up materials because it was like an open um, book sort of Jeopardy pre preparation game. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And once again, this intentional use of engagement, intentionally finding ways to invite students and to ensure that all our students are a part of the experience. So thank you for doing that. That's wonderful. Any other thoughts before we go into our final reflective activity for the day? Yes, please, Hoy. Can we talk a little bit about why some students don't feel comfortable participating? Yeah, yeah. Are there, it sounds like you have a thought behind that that you, that you want to bring forward, but I would love to take that up. Yeah, I guess for me, it was uh, like there are a couple of things that caught my attention, but I haven't fully processed. Mm -hmm. It's one that I feel like many of our colleagues, they base, they give points for participation, which means that if a student doesn't participate, uh, they miss out. And another thing was, uh, there was a comment about like, some students don't know the rules, whereas others know the rules. But it could be the case that we, for example, I'm a person of color, we come from communities where we know how to participate in group settings, but then we come to white spaces. And it, it's not about us not knowing how to participate in groups, but rather racism, right? Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, so makes those are the two reasons why I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this. Yes, and I and thank you for bringing that up because we that is a big part of not only asking uh, what trends we're noticing, but digging into the why and the how and and the deeper questions that are part of it. Because you're right, um, <clears throat> for a lot of our students, we're sometimes overtly and sometimes um, under the radar, is telling them that they're not allowed to be a part of that space but not valuing what they do elsewhere, not valuing what they do in the classroom um, or what they do in their, in their home lives or their, uh, in their other spaces. Um, I'm gonna ask you this way. How are you, what are some of the ways that you bring students into these places and encourage them to, to interact? So I don't wanna give a lot of spoilers because I'm giving one of the workshops next. Nice. But uh, I can just say a little bit, something we do in my classroom is we have town halls where we press pause on the course and we devote the hour to talk about the climate of the classroom. And wow. then the students themselves come up with, they address the issues, they, they talk about this up front with each other, and then they come up with solutions on how to mitigate that. So that's one way. I love that. You know, being very overt about it. That's great. That's awesome. Barbara, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to uh, thank Jorge for raising this issue, right? So the, the sense of belonging, is it the onus of the students to claim their belonging or is it the onus of the instructor and, this, and, the, and, and, the, and the institution to encourage a sense of belonging and not that kind of belonging that's like, yay, you made it to college, but like a deeper sense of their value and contribution. Um, and so I, I also wanted to give a shout out to Sarah because I'm, I'm going to try to make a connection between Sarah's vulnerability and how you can make, you can, that it applies to this, this question as well. So one of the things um, that I, I almost dropped out of college because I didn't feel like I belonged. So I usually tell my students a story about how um, I was so shy that I would get a migraine headache because I couldn't contribute to the class and that as a student, I thought that meant that I wasn't prepared or there was something wrong with me and I was inadequate. And it was only through the study of education that you know, as an adult, I realized or I learned that we so often focus on the individual deficiencies versus like, you know, the structural problems. Um, and uh, so I tell students, you know, I would have maybe even have uh, not taken a class like my class that is based on a lot on discussion and not lecture. Like I flourished under lecture and I didn't do very well under discussion because I was so painfully shy and afraid that I didn't have the right language uh, and the right, right way to express myself. 
So I, I decided last semester that I would even change the language of participation. So I don't usually grade students on participation at all um, because I, I always feel like I don't know how to do that, that it doesn't seem fair. So instead I turned, changed, and some of you, I've said this at the book club meetings, that I changed the language to contribution. And then I asked the students, what contribution do you wanna make to our space? And you can write that out for yourself. And then uh, what is a contribution that you're comfortable with? What is a contribution that might, you would wanna stretch yourself a little bit and try it, you know, maybe just give it a try. And then what's a contribution that's a real stretch, that's something you would like to really grow into. And then I let students again, and I think someone else, Corey said over the course of the semester, I give them a little bit of time in class to reflect on their, on that contribution, how they're doing, and then they can assess themselves. And then that also gives them space to say, I'm just too tired. This, this is too much. I, I have too many things going on and I, I, I'm contributing by just being present. I'm contributing by even just coming to class. And like, I think validating that has been a very powerful, um, it's been powerful me for, for me as an instructor, but I think it's also powerful for students to say that they do have diverse experiences and someone is not on hundred percent all the time that that is a really big ask of any of us, especially in the pandemic. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a, another comment that came up in the chat um, <clears throat> talking about discussion and ground rules, you know, setting up community norms. That is such an important part of, of the class, just bringing that to the forefront, negotiating that with students as well, and saying, who are we as a community and how do we want to interact? all so important. Thank you all so much for sharing all these thoughts and, and these perspectives. As I noted, participation is a gift and, and I truly appreciate what you're bringing to this space. Um, <clears throat> we're coming close to the end of our time together. Uh, so I'm going to I want I'm going to ask that we take five minutes, which is hardly any time at all. <laughs> but take five minutes to think about um, these particular questions and to start to think about what you're going to do in the next semester, in the, next, in the coming year, maybe over the next two or three years. Um, but how will you reflect on your positioning and biases? How will you reflect on higher education and disciplinary history? How will you advocate for equity in your department? How will you work for equity and course level student success? And how will you watch equitable facilitation and interaction in your course, uh, in your courses? Um, so let's take about five minutes to think about some of these, your answers to these questions we'll share out in our last little bit of time together. Jeremy, can I ask sort of like a big picture question? Certainly. Um, what, in your opinion, what takes some, some of these practices we've been talking about, let's like take Barbara's example of, of expanded citation for students from like something we do to an actual assessment? Do we I need to like write it down somewhere for it to be like, I've assessed participation in a new way. I think um, for me, with my uh, particular view of assessment, it's a matter of taking time to truly notice what's going on. But what makes it an act of assessment is to do something about it, um, to use what you're seeing, what you're noticing, either in the moment to enhance um, the student learning experience right then or there, or to at least say, okay, in the future, what am I going to do based on what I'm seeing, based on my reflection, based on, um, based on what I'm noticing and use that to enhance student learning in the future. That's what makes it an assessment in my mind. Okay, so some sort of closing the loop. <laughs> yes, closing the loop is a, a wonderful term that people like to use, <laughs> but action, being action oriented, yes, definitely. Thank you.
couple more minutes, friends, to think about steps that you want to take in the in the coming semesters and years. All right, friends, so what are some of the steps that you want to take to um, provide or to bring this equity minded approach to um, your educational spaces and to uh, to do good things in the coming days? Jeremy, can I um, just throw something out there to get us started? Please. Yeah, one thing that I've been finding uh, particularly challenging or, or maybe the, something I think of as a long-term challenge is, is not only in terms of my own courses, but particularly in terms of what you're saying here in terms of um, department and also college level structural changes, that's, that seems to be much harder. Um, I've been thinking about, for example, you know, why is it that we don't attract that many students of color um, in the English major? Um, and I think proportionally we're doing fine, but I think, you know, I would, I, I, I feel like we could do better, right? And so the, the question of how to get colleagues on board with the project of kind of shifting the culture of the department um, to sort of think about equity-minded assessment, to whom are we speaking, to whom are we appealing, who are we missing, um, who doesn't feel uh, represented, um, why are we not attracting certain kinds of students, that feels to me a, a really different kind of challenge, and um, I, I just wanted to sort of raise that as an issue, but also to ask if others have been thinking about that and what are some ways that um, other folks have addressed that at the department level. And then maybe I don't even know if we could, if we have time to talk about like the college or institutional level, um, but particularly the department level. And I'm thinking particularly of colleagues who might be resistant to that, who might be thinking, you know, we're doing fine as a department. We have robust number of majors. Why do we need to kind of mess with this formula, right? So, so that's something that I've been thinking about myself as a kind of um, longer term challenge. And one thing I really appreciate that is the fact that you're actually asking that question. I mean, if um, a group of faculty members are kind of stuck in a perspective where they don't, sometimes they just need to be shaken out of that as well. And just to say, this is something we need to consider as a, as a community. So I'm glad that you are bringing that up and advocating for that openly. Um, and there are some that are going to resist and there are some folks that we will never be able to bring into this space. But if we can begin to ask those questions and make that a natural part of what we do, hopefully they become the outliers instead of, um, the people asking the questions being the outliers. Um, <clears throat> and so Sharon, you note, um, revisiting the introductory biology curriculum as a department, nice. Um, finding multiple pathways through the major instead of just um, a single a single directed manner and disaggregating data. Excellent, I love that you're doing that and thinking about ways to take that up. Other thoughts, friends, we only have a couple more minutes and I. I'm sorry for this part being so rushed, but other things that you want to do.
All right, then I want to thank you all for being a part of this space, for entering this into this discussion with me. Um, I've learned a lot from you and I've really enjoyed our, um, our interaction. Um, please feel free to contact me. My email address is uh, jschneider at laverne.edu. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, though I am rather boring, uh, but my Twitter handle is rip and ret. Um, I would love to continue to take this conversation up and uh, watch for the slides and the reference list um, with the materials that are coming out from the other wonderful sessions. Like, go see Jorge. Go listen to what he's got coming up next. So have a great day, folks. Thank you again for being a part of this. And go do wonderful and great things. <laughs>